If you have been thinking about switching to Linux or just testing it out, but you have a little bit of fear standing in your way about what might happen, are you gonna lose everything, all this kind of stuff, this video here might be for you. Thanks for checking out this video by Switch to Linux. If you like this type of content, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so. Leave us a like and a comment down below. And if you do like this type of content, you might be interested in my collection of short stories called Code Red. And uh, this is Dark Tales from Tech. Oftentimes people talk about this technology and all the great things it can do and they completely gloss over possible downsides. I wrote this book to talk about some of those possible downsides. It's a collection of 10 short stories that have been read by our Patreon supporters over the last year. They were all compiled in a book. You can pick this up anywhere where you can buy a book online. We have print book, ebook, and audio book versions. I'll go ahead and provide a link to Amazon and a link where you can find a variety of different links to it down below. So with that, let's go ahead and dive on in. And we wanna talk about testing out Linux. The first thing we wanna address is why might you want to test out Linux? And I thought about a couple of different reasons. I switched to Linux because I was really frustrated with what Windows was doing. And so I said, you know what? I don't want any of this kind of stuff. I want full control back to my system. Linux is what gave me the option to have full control, not over just on how my system looked or felt, but also over the data privacy. I don't want a big company collecting a bunch of data. I don't care if it's just basic system diagnostics. It's my internet connection. I'm paying for it. I have a metered connection. I don't want any data going back and forth between me and the server for data use or just for personal privacy matters. Like we need to know how your system is responding. I'll tell you if something's wrong, okay? And uh, there's places that you can report those things. The second is you may not like AI crammed in everything. I mean, the latest notepad has AI crammed in. Yes, it took 20 something years to get spell check. Was it 30? Maybe it took 30 years to get spell check into notepad, but they got AI into it. Yep, they're cramming that in. Maybe you're like, I just don't want AI crammed into every little thing that I do. And so Linux gives you the option to do that. There are some AI type platforms you can use in Linux. And there's a few Linux that are starting to add it into the desktop environments, like Deepin is the one I'm thinking of off the top. But for the most part, you can use AI if you want. You don't have to use it if you don't want. Also, you may not want to be forced to update your computer. There may be a time it's like, okay, I need to keep this computer stable for a period of time. Okay, really, a period of time. Let's stop all updates. On Linux, you have the ability to easily do that. You can change the, the updates there so you can update them whenever you want. If you're on Arch, if you like updating every four hours, go for it. If you wanna stay Debian, you don't have to update a lot. Or hey, even if something should be updated, you still have the personal control not to update it. That's cool. And uh, maybe you just don't want Windows 11. Windows 10 is end of life in less than a year. It is 11 months before Windows 10 goes end of life. There is for home users, you can purchase, it's either $30 a month or $30 a year. I think it's $30 a year. You can purchase one more year of security support for Windows 10. Now, big corporations, they can buy up to three years at this point in time, but after that, Yes, you can still keep using your computer, but it is Windows. A lot of security vulnerabilities are found on it frequently. And if you don't get your Windows patched, that could cause a problem. And so if you don't want Windows 11, this is the best time to start looking at switching your workflow over. And I am not an advocate of the cold turkey switch. You can do that, you can try that, and some people have successfully done it. I am a slow roll person. I started playing around with Linux. I started with my media PC. Let's see what I can do with it. I added Linux to one of my laptops, keeping the other one on Windows. I did a lot of work. I did a lot of experimenting, but I slowly got to the point where once I was ready, in case it was, uh, in my instance, it was the circumstance which I had moved into the van. At that point in time, there was just no Windows computer around anymore. So I had jumped full ship over. Actually, I think it was I think it was almost six months to a year before I did that. I was testing the computer that ultimately went into the van, which is doing my web design work on a Raspberry Pi. Worked out pretty well. 
And so those are the, the reasons why you might want to think about trying or testing Linux. So the rest of this video, I have identified five different points of overcoming the fear, gaining that courage to try switching to Linux. And uh, before we jump into this, I do want to say that, you know, the data here, uh, your lo risk of data losses is, is very minimal. But of course, informational purposes, do at your own risk. Uh, I'm going to encourage you to to look into it a little bit better and maybe you take our last tips or uh, maybe our second to the last tip, see if there's a local computer guru that can walk you through the steps. But let's go ahead and talk about the overcoming the fear because what are the things we think about? We think about losing our software. We think about the prospects of losing the computer altogether. We think about the data loss that could happen, which honestly can happen all over the place. Despite Microsoft and Google and Apple's best ditch efforts to make sure you never lose any data, it's still very possible to lose your data, particularly losing security encryption keys and things like that. But let's go ahead and talk about some of this overcoming the fear. The first principle is that computers actually can be easily restored. Uh, your files are the most important thing, so you want to make sure you have a couple different files. We did a video recently talking about backups and file backups and things like that, where I have a couple different backups. I usually have like three or four backups. Some of those are with me, some of those are off-site. So if some catastrophic thing, I, the van goes barreling down a cliff, I parachute out and I float down while the van explodes in a fireball down below, I still have a copy of my data at my friend's house. <laughs> Okay. Worst comes to worst, uh, you have that. So backing up all of your data will give you that confidence because ultimately those are the things that are important. You don't want to lose your baby pictures. You don't want to lose the vacation pictures. You don't want to lose all of your documents, all your tax records. All of that is inside of the files of your computer. In which case, if you back all that up, restoring the system is actually fairly easy and it's getting easier and easier, even for a novice. And uh, I no, don't think I've ever told this story before, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys a new story if you've followed my channel for a while. Uh, I was a technophobe all the way through high school, and I finally said, well, I'm going to go to college. I bet computers are an important thing of the future, and so I'm going to learn how to use them. So I saved up my money, and I bought a computer in the era of Windows 95. And of course, they were like $2,000 at that time for a decent computer, and this thing was a rip-roaring 100 megahertz processor. Whew, mwah, 32 amazing megabytes of RAM and the hard drive so big, those guys actually told me, you will never fill this hard drive. It was 1.6 gigabytes. <laughs> massive hard drive in that day and so it was it was kind of fun to see uh to see all that but uh, as i got into that we had a couple computer bugs i had to reinstall windows and i had to reinstall some drivers actually when they had shipped it to me they did not properly install the sound drive or the video drivers so i actually had my system installed in 256 color which was very common that time in fact 256 colors was a lot of colors that was super colorful like wow this looks cool but when i got in and actually installed the drivers for my uh, video card and I'm like I have 32 million colors it was like the first time ever you see on a screen colors more vivid ever because remember prior to this we had cable tv and vhs even that didn't replicate cover color of real life for the first time we have a monitor displaying colors in real life it was absolutely stunning to see now that's all funny back in the day. But back then, even as a person didn't know anything about computers, I learned how to uh, do computers. I learned how to open it up. I learned where the hard drive was, how to pull that out, how to put it back in. I had actually only about two years into having that computer, I upgraded the processor up to a 300 megahertz processor. And so uh, I was actually able to build and keep my system up and moving it was easier than I thought it was. And it's not like, oh, it's a computer. I don't understand it. No, take a little bit of time to figure it out. It's actually easier to do than you might think. Now, your files, as we talked about in the previous part, your files are generally the most important thing. So make sure you have a very solid backup solution. Verify those files are in no way to attach that computer. If you have a desktop computer and a laptop computer, make sure you take those files from your desktop, for example, plug it into the laptop and verify you can still grab your files. That's gonna give you a ton of confidence that you actually are in the right right step. Because if you lose your files, that's really the, the important thing. Do steps to make sure you don't. Uh, for better or for worse, however, most of our software is subscription. This means you don't have a risk of losing your software either. There was a day you'd buy your software and if you lost the disc, 
and you you know you would have to buy another copy if you had changed computers you'd have to find a way to get that software it wasn't a trivial matter of copying the files from here uh, to over there to get the software to run you actually had to get it installed there were ways to do it but it was certainly way more complicated than you think uh, but in this day and age most of our software is subscription so if you look at it or FOSS by the way and so if you look at the software you're using on a day-to-day -day basis on your computer if it's not just built into the operating system itself it's a subscription service you're using word you're using adobe products things like this now there are FOSS alternatives to some of these or many of the things you're using are FOSS, like your web browser your email client these things like this these are actually very easy to install, whether you're on Windows or on Mac or on Linux, they're all cross-platform. Most of your software is either subscription or open source software that you can install anywhere. Now, the subscription stuff you may not be able to get. You're not going to get your Adobe Suite to run on Linux well. You don't really need to run Word uh, or Microsoft Office on Linux well because you have the LibreOffice, which actually in many ways is a superior platform uh, with some limitations to some of the higher end things you might need Word for uh, or Microsoft Office for. But for the most part, LibreOffice for the average user, listen to this, the average person, I could install LibreOffice on your system. You don't even know it's not Word. Um, that is important. So you're not going to, if the worst should happen, you're not losing your software. And that really is the next big thing people think about. Now, the next point is um, uh, overcoming your fear is get a tinkering computer. Uh, uh, buying a, a lower end, a lower spec computer, a third party, a, a used computer is actually remarkably cheap. And you can run many versions of Linux remarkably well on such a computer. My writing computer that I used to write my short stories and things on, like in my book Code Red, all those were done on a, on a writing computer. That is a computer so low of specs, Windows would not run on that thing. But Linux, you don't even know it's a low spec computer. MX Linux is absolutely incredible. That's what I'm running on that thing. That thing has two gigs of RAM and a very small Atom processor. And you wouldn't know it because of how well the thing runs on Linux. And I bought that computer for $100 new. Um, you can look around. You might have, if you have a university in your town, check if they have a surplus supply store. I bought one of the computers that I have. I end up, uh, it was my backup computer of my main web design laptop died. Uh, that backup computer cost me $75 and it was a great computer. I put Linux Mint on it. It was amazingly fast and good. And you might fail to find something similar to that. Uh, you can get something not as cheap, but certainly cheaper than, than a brand new computer. Head to Best Buy or some other store, see if they have an open box sale somewhere. And that's usually 10% off of the price. And you can usually talk them into another 10% off if you're on the sales floor. Go, oh, I, I kind of like to, oh, uh. If you knock off another 10%, I'll take it. Not the bite. They want to get rid of those things. And so, um, that's a good option. Craigslist, obviously, use caution when using Craigslist, but I've had great luck on Craigslist. You know, you make sure you're not engaging in things. Well, we're gonna, I'm gonna pay you with uh, um, uh, mail order um, sub things. I'm gonna give you a gift card. Now, it's a bunch of, there are scammers over there, right? But ask good questions, look at the listing, meet in a neutral place, and test the equipment out before you hand over money. You'll be in good shape. I've had a lot of luck buying things and selling things on Craigslist. Uh, also, Amazon or eBay. Uh, these particularly, the, these can be a good place to buy used cheap equipment. In fact, my main media PC right now was a used Inspirion micro tower that I purchased from Amazon for 150 bucks. I, five years ago, and the thing is still runs great. I upgraded the spinning rust into an SSD last year. It runs great. Um, there are some areas it can lag out because it is a 10-year-old computer, but it runs great on Endeavor OS. And uh, you can see my video about Endeavor OS. Um, I'll link that on the YouTube cards here. If you're watching on another platform, yeah, search it up. I have videos about Endeavor OS. 
Um, but the thing about eBay and Amazon, these tend to favor the buyers. So if somebody rips you off, it's way easier to get your money. Now they're not as good for the sellers because it's too easy to get somebody who says, oh, I got ripped off. And then they just don't even think twice and pay the money back. But for purchasing something, for purchasing something, Amazon and eBay are great places to go and get really cheap computers. You can get them in and 100 bucks, you can have a tinkering computer that you've gotten rid of every bit of risk possible. You get the thing in and you're like, okay, now let's see what we can do with it. And then you can walk through all the different guides and tutorials I have on the channel to talk about the, the various ways that you can, you can do that. So pick up a tinkering computer, super cheap, super cheap. The next point I have down here is maybe there's a local computer club. Uh, if you, particularly again, if you have a university, there's probably some computer club over there, even if it's like a student's university thing. I'm sure if you go in, find out where they are, talk to the, uh, you know, each one of these clubs has to have a, a professor um, overseeing it. Chat with them, say, hey, I, I wanted to get started in Linux. I was wondering if anybody in your computer club could help out with that. He would either direct you to when the computer club meets, and as a non-university person, there wouldn't be a problem with you walking in. It's probably in some public open building, or he might recommend a specific person to talk to, or he might say, hey, come on by, I'll give you a hand, you know, things like that. But check around, see if there's a local computer club at a university, or just a local event. There are surprisingly a lot of local events. You get one once again, check that Craigslist. There is a place where you can say, hey, we're doing a local meetup for anybody interested in computers. You might look at seeing if somebody like a, a tech, local technical school might have a, a course on basic computer use. That person would be a good resource to go and ask information. Even if you throw a few bucks at it, that would be a good thing to learn how to, to try out Linux, particularly if you have a lot of fear about doing something wrong. That would be a really good step because then you get your hands on somebody that can help you out very well. So try that out. And then our last point I have is uh, testing out Linux with an external drive is one of the best things you can do. Because this is like, okay, I don't have an extra 150 bucks to buy a new computer, I understand. Do you have five bucks for a USB flash drive? Get a USB 3.0 or higher flash drive, 3.0, 3.1, 3.2 flash drive, and if you have the ability to take the hard drive out of your computer, which really is just get in there, you don't have to physically take the thing out, you just have to disconnect its power and or data supply. Disconnect the power and or data cable from the hard drive, which you could pull that thing out. If it's a desktop, super easy. If it's a laptop, usually that does mean taking the drive out, unless it's one of these new faggled things which solders their hard drive in, in which case it's probably a crappy computer. But in many instances, you can pull that drive out of there, flip the computer back over, run the installation onto an external hard drive or a USB drive, run the full Linux on it, shut the computer down, put the hard drive back in, and then you can change the BIOS. And I have videos about this. You can go into your BIOS, you can say, if there is a USB drive, check for the USB ports to see if there's a bootable operating system there. If there's not, then boot from the hard drive. You won't even really know the difference most of the time. The computer just does a quick check. Ah, oh, look, you plug your Linux system in. Oh, look, there's a bootable drive on the, on the flash drive. You will boot your system up and everything you do will not touch that hard drive in your computer, which means your existing computer is not impacted at all. And then you can run Linux on the other drive. Linux, you will find, is easy to install. It is way easier to install than it was when I got that Windows 95 computer. It was a lot harder back then. There wasn't the plug and play. We used to call it plug and pray. It didn't always work. You plug it in. Oh, Lord, please make it work. Please make it work. Hallelujah. You know, and then, and then you got it. But Linux these days is so easy to install. There, it's not like Windows where you gotta hunt down different drivers. Most of the stuff is built directly into it. It is easy to install. So you can see from these various steps, overcoming the fear to, to install Linux, get just getting that little bit of courage is quite easy. You can see Linux is easy to install and I would encourage you all to give it a try to test out Linux. Move beyond that fear and give it a try. So of course, uh, as we mentioned in the beginning, check out my short story collection, Code Red. You can find that anywhere you can buy books online, softback, 
uh, ebook and uh, audiobook editions are available as well. I'll provide a couple links for that down below. With that, uh, subscribe to the channel if you like this type of content, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.